on the theme, the customer obsessed enterprise, principles and practices to create value and drive growth. Mike is a global customer experience, design and innovation leader, consultant, author, and a speaker creating world-class customer loyalty, innovation, and engagement across multiple industries. Mike founded the Customer Lab, is a principal with Moves the Needle, an instructor at Southern Methodist University, and has served as director of customer experience at Capital One. Over to you, Mike. Hello, greetings, how are you? Thank you very much. Started here. All right. So I'm uh, pleased to be with you today from uh, all the way from Texas, USA. Uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, I'd love to uh, spend some time with you today to talk to you about building a customer obsessed organization. And uh, thanks for inviting me to speak with you. I appreciate your attention today. So um, I'd love to share a little bit about uh, how to think about new value and how you create new value for customers. And I've invested over 20 years of my career in doing just that mainly on the inside with large companies uh, here in the States, and then more recently consulting globally with Fortune 100 companies to help them think about driving customer-centric trans transformations, both in the digital and the physical parts of their businesses. So as we get started, I'd like to kind of uh, rewind in our time machine to a famous Austrian-born American management consultant named Peter Drucker. And uh, Mr. Drucker was born in 1909 and lived through 2005 to the age of 95 years old. And he's often described as the founder of modern management. Uh, Mr. Drucker taught that a company's primary responsibility is to create value for its customers and that profit is not the primary goal, but it's an outcome of that uh, primary purpose a necessary condition for existence and sustainability. And I think the words that he spoke so many years ago really seem to resonate uh, today in the situation that we're in with the economy and with the pandemic and with customer power shifting. And uh, he said that the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence itself, but the act uh, to act with yesterday's logic or sort of thinking about what you're going to do in the future with this rear view mirror mentality. And I think if you re rewind your, your mind back to a year ago when the coronavirus pandemic started happening, um, everything shifted almost overnight. You know, it was the fastest, most unknown change that we'd probably faced in most of our careers. And even a year later, I still see companies struggling with that shift, struggling to adapt, finding new ways of attracting customers, or even just uh, the, keeping the customers they have or delighting them. But uh, in troubled times, I also like to look for wisdom from another great management consultant, a uh, cartoon strip called Dilbert. And Dilbert's boss, unfortunately, reflects the mindset of some of the managers that haven't been able to make that shift even before the pandemic. So Dilbert's boss says, our highest priority is satisfying our customers, except when it's hard or unprofitable or when we're busy. And rather than press into that challenge, I've seen some organizations with a hunker down mindset or a mentality of let's ride this storm out. Uh, they've stopped innovating, they've reduced or eliminated new product or idea generation, uh, or they've avoided running experiments with, to find new ways to serve customers. And ironically, as we've seen some of the bigger companies stop innovating, we're seeing the smaller companies with less cash flow actually be on the cutting edge of innovation and on the forefront. Uh, things like curbside pickup at restaurants or repurposing wholesale products for direct to the public uh, and finding new ways of working, um, and which we're all kind of doing right now. So as we get into this, I'd like to get us grounded on a definition of what obsession means. Sometimes it could be a maybe a negative connotation, but I like the way that Cambridge University describes it 
as something or someone that you think about all the time. So that ever present um, obsession that you have, in this case, about the customer. So if you're to think about uh, customer obsession or envisioning how your organization could behave differently or perform differently um, and create that value for customers on a regular basis, this is clearly not how Dilbert's boss was thinking about running his business. And, and another point to consider here uh, that I'd like to call out with this definition is that everyone in your organization has a customer. Anybody who receives or consumes a product or a service, makes a decision or uh, gets an output from some process or from some product, those are customers. And so everyone in your organization should be partnering to think about who is their customer and how are they obsessing about that, whether it's an internal or external customer. So I think I may be, to, to coin a phrase here in the States, uh, preaching to the choir with the, the next few slides, but I thought it was important to reground us on why customer or customer obsession matters and uh, look at it from a data perspective. And so I've pulled together a few things that you probably already understand, but maybe the people you're trying to influence in your organization, this could be some ammunition for you. So let's start with revenue growth. This is a study from Forrester that shows that companies with better customer experiences have five times greater co compound annual growth rates <clears throat> than those with lesser customer experiences. And um, so top line growth obviously is important, but what about profitability? Uh, a Deloitte study here reveals that six, there's a 60% advantage for customer, for companies uh, from a profitability perspective, if they're more customer centric over those that are less customer centric. And a big reason that companies have improved profitability is that customers in general are willing to pay more for a better product or a better experience. In fact, in this study, 86% of consumers will pay more when they believe that you're offering a better experience. And uh, think about, you know, sometimes we'll pay a premium, right? And so, uh, Sometimes things like Disney or it could be a Mahindra, Mahindra product in, in India or you, you think of those brands where, you know, you, you say, hey, I'm getting a better value and I'm not really going to uh, go for the discount product in some cases. Uh, there's also a multiplier effect that continues as you start to evoke passion in your customers or delight. Um, it's not only that the loyal customers are going to spend more with you, but they will stay longer. They'll be more loyal. They'll promote your brand to other people. So free marketing, essentially, and that they're going to give up their time to help you innovate new offers. They gladly will, will share feedback and then maybe even participate in some product and experience co-creation. So to me, this is a really great way to think about hitting the bottom line in a dramatic fashion, just a 5% increase in customer retention it leads to a 25% boost in profits. And you've probably heard a lot about the link between employee engagement and customer experience. Employee experience has really become uh, in fashion lately. Um, this is an interesting study that shows on average companies that perform better in customer experience are seeing a 19% lift in employee engagement. And uh, this becomes a virtuous cycle where the engaged employees are going to continue to perpetuate that great experience and create better affection for your brand. So if you think about uh, customer obsession, starting with um, empathy, it's really this whole idea of understanding and feeling the pain of the customer. And uh, I was surprised to find that there's actually people out there measuring empathy. This is from something called the Empathy Index. And it shows that companies who are better at gaining widespread customer empathy are generating 50% more earnings than those at the bottom of this index for empathy. And this is really something that you see in organizations that start to set them apart from their competitors. The way the people work, the way they treat the customers, the way they treat each other, it's not just a philosophy, but it's about engaging and working in a different way. So let's, let's, camp on empathy a little bit. What is empathy? Uh, in my mind, it's simply putting yourself in the shoes of your customers 
It's not necessarily reading surveys or digesting research results or looking at data, but it's spending time with consumers, with customers, even businesses that are B2B and going through what they go through. Um, I was um, surprised yesterday. I heard a story about a uh, hotel company, a large chain that had hired a, a mystery shopper, professional shopper, if you will, that was paid throughout the year to stay at their hotels and provide detailed feedback. And um, one of the pieces of feedback that really impressed the hotel executives was this mystery shopper said that the wheels on the trolley or the the maid's cart that runs through the housekeeping cart that runs through the halls were squeaky and that they ought to get that fixed. And they thought that was an, an impressive piece of feedback. Uh, for me, I thought, well, isn't that something that your um, your employees should have been able to pick up on in the beginning? They should have had that empathy for the cons consumer and said, why is that squeaking there? Well, let's get rid of it. Uh, but even more bothering to me or troublesome was this idea that you have to pay somebody to be your customer when you could just be asking your real customers, right? You could be talking with real customers. You could be mystery shopping yourself. Your executives could stay in the hotels. Your employees could go stay in the hotels and then provide that feedback. So you can't outsource empathy. You have to do it yourself. And especially at the C-suite and the top levels, have to get out of the boardroom and have to spend time in the shoes of the customer to really start to begin to create that obsessed culture. So here's a, another graphic that was a little bit surprising to me. Um, this is from the CEO of Ryanair. And he said, if I'd only known that being nice to customers was going to work out so well, I'd have started many, many years ago. And unfortunately, that reflects a mindset shift that hasn't happened with some leaders. And um, I, I think it's beyond being nice. It's got to be more systematic than that. But uh, I think that, um, that that it is somewhat blindingly obvious to us in the CX field, but you have to sometimes help get the, get the leaders there. And you need empathy for those leaders to get them there. So this is just one tool that I use frequently with clients to help them get there. And, and it's this idea of... Um, be taking deliberate action and steps based on evidence that you get from customers that you're doing the right thing to build loyalty. And so if you think about how do you make a customer aware of your existence, of your products, uh, what do you have to do as an organization to make that happen? What behavior can you observe that the customer shows they know about you and that they're starting to get intrigued? How do you measure that? And not all the way through the value stream here of, intrigued to trusting, to convinced, to hopeful, satisfied, and ultimately delighted or passionate. Each step of that journey, you have to do something as a company and then observe a behavior that proves that customer is moved to the next stage. And you have to have a metric there to prove that there's evidence that it's real. And that's where your constant experimentation with customers comes in is you're constantly testing to see how you move them along that value stream and how you create value to ultimately get them to being loyal or passionate customers. So I think if you think about the economy we're in, the, the new, even before COVID, the new approach that customers were looking for and how one company in a totally different industry might have the ability to disrupt your industry just because they did something different. Um, I think a lot of companies used to be able to dominate in their markets or with their competitors by having one or maybe two of these pieces of the obsession framework that they were really good at. But I don't think that's the case anymore. I think the companies that are surviving and thriving have to have all three. And that's a good customer-centered design approach, a good delivery approach for that's focused on customers, and a strong customer-centric culture. And those three together create that secret sauce to be a digitally enabled customer-centered company and um, it's like a three-legged stool. So if you took any one of these legs off the stool, the stool is going to fall over and you have to get good at all three. And traditionally, most companies have been good at one or two, but not all three. So let's dig a little bit deeper into these three capabilities. And uh, hopefully that can help you shore up some of those areas that you might uh, need some help in. So what we found uh, is the fastest and most effective way to design new products and new customer experiences that are going to not just satisfy but delight customers is through a combination of methodologies like design thinking, 
lean startup and agile. So companies tend to pick one of those, but they don't usually combine all three. And the companies we're working with that are really good at customer centered design have molded those three together. And the way you do that is starting with empathy, right? Understand your customers so deeply, maybe better than they understand themselves and understand what their pains are, what their aspirations are, and then start ideating on solutions for those things that you're uniquely equipped to solve. Uh, start running experiments rapidly. You can run hundreds of experiments, sometimes in a week or two, if you get good at this. And then start to think about, um, do you have enough evidence that those experiments, that your assumptions are true and that you should go build something? Don't waste a lot of time thinking you're right, just because the highest paid person uh, in the room said something or somebody that's been with a company said 30 years said something doesn't mean they're right. And so there's a bit of humility here. Uh, I talked yesterday in the panel about a humility deficit in some companies, but you need to let the customer prove you right or wrong. Uh, I'll give you an example of um, a product company I worked with. They embedded one of their product managers at a client's office as a B2B software company. They did that for one week and had that employee work as an intern, basically, um, to see how the company used their software, what the problems were, and some just fascinating insights that they got. Because after an hour, maybe talking to a customer, you get one level of insight. But if you're there with them for a week, seeing all the pains and problems, it's a totally different insight. Also, um, you need to think about um, do you, how do you do this inside your company? So I've worked with companies where they use these methodologies to redesign the employee experience, the call center screens, the flow, the workflow, uh, sitting side by side with the reps day after day to see where their problems are, and just using scrappy paper prototypes before you even start building any code. So this combination of zooming into your customer types and the problems that they're having uh, while using empathy and experiments to test those solutions really helps you ensure and make the best decisions so you can de-risk those quickly, not spend a lot of money or time wasted that you don't have real evidence from the market or from the consumer. So the second leg of the stool that, that we talk about is this uh, customer-centric delivery. So you've built the perfect mousetrap. You've got a product that people love, an experience that people love. That's not enough. You've got to actually execute on it consistently. And sometimes I see great designs get thrown into operations and then they're sub-optimized. They cut costs, they change the design, and the value that was in evidence with customers from the design stage doesn't get executed well. So there's a number of different things you can do to make that happen. Uh, we put together what we call the customer delivery periodic table, which is in three phases around deployment and analysis, management of the process or the uh, execution, and then this improvement and innovate loop at the, at the end of it. So it's just different disciplines in here that are probably being used in some parts of your company, but it brings it into more of a structure that is focused on the company uh, or focused on the customer so that your solution can be fully executed. Um, and one of the things I, I wanted to dwell on a little bit here is this idea of end to end. So many companies, uh, I wrote an article last year about the silo syndrome and how so many companies are in these silos and they can't think end to end. So we've tried to journey map and we've tried to do all these things, but we haven't changed the org structure. We don't have a single person that has the air traffic controller view of the airport. There's still just a lot of pilots flying around, but they don't know if they're going to bump into each other. So having an experience owner or a product owner that has authority across those silos is super important and uh, happy to share examples of that with you offline if, you, if you're interested in how to do that. Um, the other piece, I think, is this improvement loop of having a 360 view of how you're doing. So what's important? Uh, do you know the key drivers of loyalty? Have you validated that with data? How are we doing against those priorities, both internally and externally against our competitors? And what are our priorities for improvement? What's our backlog of improvements? And how have we stack ranked those for improvement? Um, and, and I think having a mature customer listening system that's predictive and also um, quickly react when something goes wrong is very important. 
And then the third leg of the stool, culture, which is maybe a little harder to get our heads around because it's not something we learned in business school or, you know, unless we went to had a psychology degree, maybe. But even that is building a, a, a obsessed company culture around the customer uh, is very important, but sometimes difficult. So uh, to me, it always starts with the compelling or inspirational purpose of why do you exist? What, do, what is it you do that nobody else can do really well for your customer? And why is that something that people should be excited about? How do you attract people that are on a mission for that purpose and being a very missional company? Um, what are your values? What's acceptable and non-acceptable behavior as a company and for your brand and for your employees? And have we agreed upon all that? And have we used it to be a competitive advantage uh, through hiring selection, em uh, you know, employee reviews, is that baked into our culture? I think uh, Apple Retail here in the U.S., they, they call their purpose uh, is enriching lives, which sounds pretty high level uh, for a retail electronics store, but they truly try to live that out and say that it's not just about selling uh, an iPad or selling a computer or an iPhone, but it's really about making somebody's life better uh, as a result of that. Um, what kind of supporting values do you think are necessary to do that? Um, what kind of boundaries do you think they have? Uh, how, in the, how are they going through uh, in selecting the right kind of people for that, rewarding and recognizing them and compensating them? And then um, what, what type of inspiration do they have? And I think there's a number of companies you can look to that have done a good job, both on purpose, shared values, and then behaviors. Um, here in the States, we talk a lot about Warby Parker. Everybody globally, I think, talks about Amazon. Uh, ING Bank uh, is a global organization. Uh, Intuit, Slack, Rackspace. Uh, Delta Airlines, uh, USA is a U.S. company here, but a number number of examples. I'm sure you have those in, in your regions as well. So don't don't just neglect culture as something that happens. I remember hearing uh, I think it was Reed Hoffman, the CEO of uh, LinkedIn, when he was uh, probably three or four years into building LinkedIn, he came and spoke at a company I was uh, at, and he said he really wished at the time he founded the company he had written down the values and made them non-negotiable because as they grew, they started hiring people that didn't reflect those values and they had to go back and sort of retrofit. So it was a lot harder later. So whatever point you're in in your journey, it's really important to get that, that true north established. So uh, in addition, and this is a challenging thing for me as a former Six Sigma Master Black Belt and process guy that has moved into more of the design and innovation space and CX, that there's method and there's mindset. And so we can study the methods all day, but if the mindsets in the company aren't right, it's not going to really help you thrive and, and survive as a business. And I, um, I remember uh, one of my old bosses years ago wrote on my whiteboard the first day I worked there, he wrote, mindset begets behavior and behavior begets outcomes. And so often as leaders, we start with outcomes. We say that we need to achieve this, that, and the other. We need to grow by so much. But we tend to ignore the behaviors that are needed to get to that outcome. And even more important, the mindset that's required in the employees and the leaders to act on those behaviors. So thinking about that, uh, you have to have some core mindsets established. And I'll just walk you through a few of these that are, are really important to have a customer obsessed culture in your business. First um, is what I just mentioned. And then the next is this idea that you need to fall in love with the customer's problem, not your solution. Um, nobody wants to know that their baby's ugly when they're born, but you really have to get that brutal feedback and maybe your product is ugly, right? Maybe the customer doesn't like it as much as you do. And so putting that, bringing out that humility and saying, tell me what you hate about it, show me where it goes wrong. And then really starting to understand their pain and living that. The next thing is this idea of managing versus mentoring. Uh, sometimes leaders like to make decisions as Caesar would and say thumbs up, thumbs down. I'm the manager, I'm the leader, I'm supposed to make the decision. But more and more in this world of uncertainty that we have, the leaders don't have all the answers and sometimes the employees don't either. It's the customer that has the answers. So 
the teams that are working with customers to solve those problems need support from a mentor as opposed to a manager. And managers need to know when to make that flip. If you're in the design or the unknown space of that leg of the stool, it's more mentoring. If you're in the execution stage, the delivery, then it's more managing because you're in the known, known world at that point. Uh, the other piece is just this humility of assume we're wrong. Let's go into it saying we really don't know until it's proven true by the customer. So stack rank your assumptions and go test them. Um, have an inspirational mission or purpose for your organization or your team. Uh, solve for the one, then the many. Um, it's so, so much of the time we want a big persona or a cohort that we're going to solve for millions or hundreds of millions of people if we're a big company. But you, if you can't solve it for one customer first, then you're wasting time on going for going big too soon. And uh, there's a lot of stories I could share with you of teams where that was a big aha moment where they spent time face to face with the customer and then iterated their solution to fix that uh, that need. Then to be let the value be defined by the customer, not by the company, and then measure the impact defined by the customer. Um, so this whole idea of <clears throat> letting the metrics that run your organization not be about vanity or theater, but be truly customer driven and measure the things that matter most to the customer and to delivering that value to the customer. So those are just some of the mindsets. You may have different ones you need for your business, but uh, I would, would challenge you maybe to assess where you are as a company at the leadership level and below on these mindsets. So just to recap, um, customer centricity is essential, not only for survival in, in the world that we live in today, but um, it's also essential for thriving and winning in your industry. And to do that, you've got to be good at all three of these disciplines around customer obsessed design, customer obsessed delivery, customer obsessed culture. And it's really underpinned by those values that we talked about and the behaviors that come from those values, so the mindset of how we do that method and mindset. So we'll jump back to where we started with obsession, this definition of obsession of, of something or someone that you think about all the time. Um, is your organization obsessed? Do you have a framework for getting there if you're not? Um, is this approach something that you're using at a corporate level or a division level or a team level? Um, you can really use this framework at any of those stages. And I would really encourage you today, if there's some part of what I said that resonated that maybe you saw as a gap or an opportunity for your organization, write that down right now. You know, Don't let this become a monument to te temporary knowledge. Get three things written down today that you're gonna go do later today or tomorrow or you can put a reminder on your calendar for next week to follow up on those things so you don't forget about it. And um, if, you, if you're comfortable and you wanna share those stories with me, I'd love to engage with you and, and learn more about uh, your challenges. Um, you know, for better or worse, I've been through a lot of this with a lot of companies and happy to share any of that knowledge with you. Uh, so please reach out. If you'd like the slides, you can just hold your camera up to the screen and capture that, um, that QR code and uh, go there, or you can send me an email or uh, uh, jump on to uh, Twitter and send me a note. Uh, but I really appreciate your time today. Uh, happy that uh, we were able to spend the time together. Hopefully next time we can do it in person. Would love to meet a lot of you here and uh, uh, get to know you better. But um, we're, we're make the best of it with the digital experience. So thank you so much. I appreciate your time.